Okay. So first of all, um, welcome to the lecture, Physics of Genes. Um, the, in the past, I, I had a lecture, the, there were like two lectures um, on synthetic biology. And my feeling was that um, the synthetic biology topics that we covered often were very qualitative so it's just like a survey of papers that people have written and it was not so much quantitative stuff and things where you could make a calculation or so so therefore i wanted to talk a little more about the the basics so physics of genes is partly physics but in i think more generally it would be the attempt to to quantitatively study certain um topics that have to do with with genes and gene expression, and uh, of course, essentially, what we are going to do is the is is talk about the central dogma. So how we come from DNA to RNA to protein. There are several kind of processes involved, and and what sort of physics says about it. And and uh, there are certain topics that I, I will probably uh, emphasize more than others. And if you want, of course, we can also talk about kind of synthetic biology applications sometimes, uh, maybe also in the exercises, uh, but it will not be the, the main uh, topic in the end. So the so the the outline would look like this, but it might change if, if there is too much overlap with the other lecture. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little about historical things today and about the chemical structure of DNA. Uh, just as a very uh, basic introduction. And then there is a range of topics that have to do mo uh, with the uh, the molecule itself, in a sense. So DNA and RNA, how stable is the molecule? And stability uh, refers, on the one hand, to the thermodynamic stability. So whether, for example, DNA duplexes form or, or RNA form secondary structures. So there's a lot of work on that. And I think that Günther Wick is not going to talk so much about that. So I'm going to talk more about thermodynamics than he will do, probably. But then there's also DNA mechanics and topology. And this is something that will be in his lecture. So I will need to figure out how much we talk about this. Essentially, the, the point is that DNA is, uh, as a double helix, is a relatively rigid molecule. And, and people have measured sort of its, its kind of bending rigidity with different methods. And this also plays a role in, in a biological context because it determines how big DNA is, kind of as a, like how big, for example, a genome is and how you can uh, compact it and put it into, into a cell. And um, topology plays a big role because DNA is a helical, like double helical molecule. And uh, this plays a, a role in that sense that, uh, for example, DNA in cells is um, typically as an, uh, is, is uh, um, twisted. So it's, it's not, it's not in, its, in its relaxed form. And there are also ideas that uh, there, there are some type of mechanical communication between, for example, proteins that bind to to DNA and that they might change sort of maybe a little of the twist of the DNA. And this is felt by another molecule a little away from it. So therefore, these things are actually quite important. And there's also a class of enzymes, the so-called topoisomerases, that are dedicated to manipulating this because you always end up with topological problems when you replicate DNA. So you make like two pieces of double-stranded DNA out of one. And because many genomes are circular, you will always generate kind of a, a mess uh, in during this process, which needs to be resolved somehow. So therefore, it's an important topic, but I don't know how much. Uh, <laughs> so we will see how much Günther will talk about it. What Günther Wilk is not going to talk about is polyelectrolyte properties. So therefore, this might be a major part in our lecture. So DNA is a highly charged molecule. It uh, has two negative charges per base pair, uh, which means every like 0 0.34 nanometers. 
and that makes it an extremely charged molecule. And this plays a big role in, in, in many kind of contexts. Um, and therefore, it's, it's kind of important. It's actually a relatively complicated topic uh, also because uh, many of these electrolyte things are not so easy to also to describe. Um, so that would be things that mainly relate to the molecule itself or the DNA and, and RNA as far as I talk about RNA. And then the rest will deal more with the, the real kind of process that the processes that have to do with um, gene expression, but also replication of DNA. And uh, first of all, there are uh, we need to talk a little about DNA binding proteins because most processes somehow involve proteins that bind to, to DNA. And here a classic topic in biophysics is the search for a target site. So this is something that we can talk a, a little uh, about um, in one lecture. And it has to do with the, the problem, how, uh, how can a protein find its, its one specific binding site in a, in a cell in a decent amount of time, which is actually, um, there, there are many, many papers on that, um, which is an interesting physics problem also. Um, then the next topics are a little less maybe physics, physics -y, but more like typical molecular biology stuff. So it's uh, we are going to talk about transcription, transcription regulation, and also translation. So what physics can uh, say about these things is that on the one hand, you can, for example, you can look at DNA and RNA polymerases and ribosomes as molecular machines or molecular motors. They they use kind of some energy to to uh, uh, exert their function and they, they actually also move along the, the DNA or RNA so they can also be regarded as molecular motors if you want. So this is something that one can talk about. Uh, but there are also other aspects that have to do, for example, with the search process. So how does a uh, polymerase actually find its, its uh, binding site and how it is stabilized maybe by other proteins, so-called transcription factors. So you can do also some statistical mechanics treatment of the whole process. Another important thing, and this is something that I haven't talked a lot about in previous lectures, but if uh, Günther takes too much of my mechanics part, I will talk more about stochastic gene expression. And that uh, has to do with the fact that in cells, you only have a very small number of certain molecules which means that if you really um, sort of that the treatment that, that we are used to from chemistry using, for example, um, rate equations uh, and, and measuring everything in concentrations or so is not, uh, sometimes doesn't really give you the, 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 the real insight because in, uh, for example, you only, you only have one or two molecules in a cell then it's often more like, uh, is the molecule bound or not? So you have more like a on or off kind of process. And it's it's not, uh, and, and this actually also leads to something like, uh, um, something called noisy uh, gene expression, for example. So sometimes the gene is, is on for a certain time, then it's off and then it's on again. And that's a very different description from uh, from a rate equation or chemistry type of uh, description, and that that's uh, and there's a lot of mathematical uh, overhead coming with the uh, the description of stochastic processes. So DNA replication uh, also is important. Also in, involves, of course, uh, molecular motors, um, and um, it um, has has uh, many other kind of interesting implications, and I, I will. It depends a little on on how far we get. So on the one hand, it's interesting to just look at the process. I have to say that a colleague uh, uh, here at the TUM, Karl Duderstadt, he's an absolute expert in in DNA replication. So maybe uh, if you really want to know everything about it, you need to consult him. I, I'm not sure whether. He's probably not going to give a, a talk about that, but there are many kind of it, 
uh, it's a very complicated process with many uh, enzymes that bind to the DNA, unwind the DNA some, uh, and then you have this problem with the, the lagging strand and the leading strand, and, and there's a lot of stuff going on, which can be studied on a single molecule uh, level with all kinds of biophysics techniques. So that's that's kind of an interesting topic. The other thing, of course, is that replication is also kind of maybe one of the one of the things that that are important for the emergence of life in the first place. So one could also give the lecturers uh, like an origin of life twist at this point, because many people have, of course, thought about how uh, the first sort of self-replicating or replicating molecules emerged in the first place. And so maybe I'm going to go more in this direction at this point, depending on how how we feel about it. Um, one has to say that there is uh, a lot of activity on origin of life in Munich in the last years. There is an excellence cluster called Origins, which is supposed to kind of start essentially at the big sort of the researchers in this cluster started at the Big Bang. And the question is how how the universe sort of developed to generate the molecules that are finally uh, required to start life on this planet. And But there's some argument about which molecules exactly th these were in the beginning. And uh, But it's, it's a rather chemical... Uh, topic, I would say, but there are other researchers and also collaboration networks on kind of the next steps, how you would get from the first kind of replicating mm -hmm. molecules to the first kind of cell or protocell. And that that's kind of interesting in, in this sense. Um, and maybe I'm, I'm talking a little about that. And physical structure of natural DNA will then sort of integrate things that I have talked about uh, before, so how much DNA you can actually uh, compress into a cell or a bacterium or a virus and uh, how that actually looks like. And maybe in the end, uh, we are also going to talk about phase separation phenomena. Uh, that's also a hot topic in, in cell biology over the last years that, that um, apparently many uh, cell uh, constituents somehow condense into droplets in a cell, and uh, and that they appear to also play uh, a biological uh, role in in that sense that they somehow separate components from each other in the cell without requiring a membrane, and that's uh, uh, interesting and. Um, one specific type of droplet that occurs is in, in the cell nucleus that, uh, and uh, this is where, for example, the uh, splicing takes place uh, of uh, mRNAs in, in eukaryotes. And splicing, again, is one of these super complicated processes. And uh, we can also maybe talk about the, the splicing uh, process at this point. But it, you see, it's, it's probably already too many topics for, for this, uh, so we will see how far this goes. And in terms of the the tutorials, uh, that these the idea behind the tutor, uh, tutorials will be that I will kind of there there will be exercises where we calculate something, and uh, that could be ca calculating thermodynamic properties, determining secondary structures, uh, calculating mechanical properties, uh, and then later on it's more like solving. Uh, differential equations and maybe also master equations if we uh, come to uh, stochastic processes. Um, so the I, I guess the exercises in the end will not be very different from the exercises we had for the other lecture in, in uh, synthetic biology, but maybe a little uh, deeper and, and uh, hopefully. So, okay, that, that was that. Um, um, and I'm I'm going to use the the rest of the lecture today to talk about the kind of uh, some of the historical um, aspects. And well, um, so 
This is uh, Friedrich Miescher. He's uh, usually cited, uh, or he is the person who discovered DNA. And he's actually uh, a Swiss uh, who, uh, but he discovered it in Tübingen uh, in uh, in Germany uh, in a lab. I, I don't know whether we have the, so in this, there's, uh, this is the castle in Tübingen. Um, and apparently in this uh, castle, they, they had chemistry labs where he was playing around with, with stuff. And he actually uh, had um, um, experiments uh, where he actually extracted a material from, from cells, from biological uh, material. Uh, and these are kind of ugly experiments here. Uh, Eiter uh, how is it translated? Uh, maybe somebody knows. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I think it's pus, isn't Eiter is pus. Uh, this is like when you have a wound and it starts to, it's infected and you have this pus, then there, there were bandages around these and, and he just took these bandages and extracted the material. And then you can, um, and he checked these things uh, for sort of their chemical properties. So there, at this time, it was known that there's a protease uh, pepsin that degrades uh, proteins. So, uh, and he found that there is material left after treatment with protease. So, so that sort of indicated it's not a protein what you have in this material. And he made other types of uh, investigations and uh, in the end, it, it was clear that there was a lot of phosphorus in uh, these um, in this material, which is untypical for uh, for proteins. Of course, you can have uh, phosphorylation in proteins, but it's not a major uh, part, um, and uh, it doesn't have sulfur. Sulfur is a major part of proteins, so so therefore. It was clear that this must be something very different from proteins. Uh, it's, it was also kind of clear that it, it's not a lipid. And uh, therefore, he said, well, this is, uh, he called it nuclein. Um, uh, I actually don't know why he, he chose that name. But it was sort of clear there is a biological material. It's not a protein. It's not a lipid. And he called it uh, a nuclein at this point. Um, the, so that was about 68, 69. And uh, it's a little difficult to track the histories sometimes. And I think one of the reasons, of course, is that people were not communicating so much and so easily as, as we do today. So there are often parallel developments that, that people maybe later realized that they were actually working on the same thing and didn't somehow realize that. And... Uh, so here, a uh, uh, chemist isolated the nucleobases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil. Uh, later on, somebody uh, called Altman called the material nucleic acid, but he somehow didn't know that the nucleic acid that he was talking about is the same as the nuclein that Misha uh, detected. I, I don't know why they, they chose the same name then, more or less, but uh, okay, maybe I should read the history again. <laughs> but it's, uh, then, uh, of course, adenine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil, these are the bases, but uh, in DNA, you have bases, you have a sugar unit, and you have the phosphates, and we, we come to this later. So Levin later discovered actually the sugars that are a part of the uh, of the DNA or nucleic acids, uh, ribose and deoxyribose. And he also then chose the term nucleotide, which is used for the combination of the sugar and the base and the, the phosphor. Um, at, uh, also the tetranucleotide hypothesis came up uh, that was also later uh, and used by uh, for, by Chargaff and the tetranucleotide uh, proposal uh, looks like this here. So uh, people figured out that you have like these four bases in in DNA, for example, adenine, uh, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, and 
in order to make sense of that, one proposal was that maybe there's a molecule that looks like this, where you have a, a cyclic molecule where the four bases are sort of um, in each of the corners of, of this uh, structure. Um, so that was later um, sort of used by Chargaff. So he, okay, maybe maybe I'm, uh, I'm I'm talking nonsense now. So the point that assumption at that point was that you always have the same uh, ratio. Uh, you have a ratio of G to C to T to A of one to one to one to one. And uh, later, of course, people figured out that this is not true. Uh, in particular, what, what you find, of course, is that you have the same number of A's as T's and the same number of G's and C's because they base pair. And that is then called the Chargaff rule that the bases are present at fixed ratios. And it, the ratio is not one to one to one to one. <clears throat> Um, but the, that actually DNA has something to do with genes and gene expression was also not known at this point. So the, they, they somehow detected this molecule, but didn't know what it uh, was good for. And that was actually relatively, it took a very long time <clears throat> and several kind of important experiments then showed that DNA actually is the carrier of genetic information and there's one uh, paper here by Avery McLeod <clears throat> and one by Hershey and Chase that sort of established that. But still at this time, it was not clear how DNA actually looks like as a molecule or as a, as a macromolecule. <clears throat> so what was known at that point is that DNA is kind of the molecule that uh, represents the genes and it was clear that it contains uh, the sugar and the bases and the phos uh, phosphate here, but not the structure. So there was uh, several people, of course, well, worked on this uh, problem because it was clear that this would be a major discovery. And uh, uh, Linus Pauling, uh, a, a famous chemist, worked on the problem. He actually also worked on a helical protein structures uh, uh, or already. And I think uh, inspired by kind of his models for, for helical proteins or peptides, uh, he also made such a model for DNA. And th this model looks very different from uh, what we, what was found later. So he suggested that somehow the phosphates point to the interior and make kind of this structure and that the bases maybe somehow stack on top of each other and, and uh, point outwards. So that's the uh, triple helix uh, model by, by Pauling. And uh, the in a, in a sense, it's, it's uh, strange that one, uh, well, you would not usually expect such a uh, structure because the phosphates, they, are uh, negatively charged, so they need to somehow be cramped together. And of course, they would usually like to be in contact with the with water in an aqueous environment, whereas the bases actually are rather hydrophobic. And uh, I think that later people found similar structures like this when you actually bring DNA into sol in into different solvents, where you maybe. Uh, do not have favorable kind of sol solvation of the DNA, it, it might actually invert its structure and point the bases outwards. And then the structures look a little more like this, uh, but it's not the, the native structure that we would get in cells. Um, um, I'm coming to the double helix in a few uh, slides. Uh, here, just these other important experiments that actually established that um, uh, DNA is the genetic material. So there's actually one experiment even preceding these other two, which was this one that so, uh, the so-called uh, Griffiths experiment. Yeah. And I just copied that from Wikipedia. So that uh, the, these were experiments with uh, bacteria that are called pneumo 
uh, coccus and uh, these uh, these are kind of spherical bacteria that apparently have a smooth appearance when they are active, so when they are virulent, and when they are, uh, and there is there are apparently also bacteria that do not infect um, uh, their hosts when you uh, uh, when they have a, a kind of a rough exterior appearance. I'm not sure how this exactly looks like, uh, but probably you can just distinguish them under the microscope. Now, the the, the main experiment here was that you actually can uh, inactivate the smooth strain by just heating it up. So you uh, and you somehow kill the bacteria, and then you inject these dead bacteria into the mouse. It will kind of survive it. It will not be infected, and the the big uh, Kind of uh, uh, the, the important part of this experiment is that when you now mix the non-virulent uh, bacteria, but the bacteria who who actually are uh, sorry, they these are alive uh, uh, these bacteria, but are not virulent. Whereas um, these uh, when you mix them with the heat killed smooth strain, then the mouse suddenly dies again. And the interpretation of that experiment is that when you kill the, these kind of uh, the smooth strain bacteria, they sort of the, the bacteria break open and release their genetic material to the environment. And then this is actually taken up by the other bacteria and they become virulent. So there, there is a, some kind of virulence factor in the uh, genes or the, um, the, the content of these. Uh, bacteria that is taken up. And that's actually a, a, pro, a process in bi biology you call this transformation. If a bacterium takes up um, uh, genetic material from the environment. So that's that's kind of a common process. Uh, and uh, that indicated that um, sort of this, um, that there is there is something in these bacteria that that causes the disease, um, and he called it transforming principle. But uh, uh, only later, actually, uh, Avery McLeod and McCarty showed that this is actually the, the DNA in these bacteria. So at uh, at this time, Griffith didn't know what actually content of the bacteria caused that, and later it was then realized that the DNA inside of these kind of virulent bacteria actually were the, the cause for that. So that's, uh, um, so they essentially, they used purified DNA and then added that to the mice and, uh, sorry, to the, to the, to non-virulent bacteria. And they took the, the purified uh, DNA and uh, and the experiment still worked. So in this sense, it was shown that it was the DNA that was taken up by the bacteria. So the other uh, famous experiment is Hershey and Chase. And uh, that's slightly different. That's with bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. You probably all know uh, these things already. And these uh, bacteriophages are these little like uh, structures here. Uh, that contain genetic material, they they somehow dock on the the uh, bacterial cell wall and somehow inject their material into the bacteria. And what they did in these experiments uh, are essentially two types of experiments. Where uh, in one experiment, the 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 protein code of the bacteriophages was labeled radioactively. And in another experiment, the DNA inside of the bacteria was labeled radioactively. So when you do the experiment with the phages that are radioactively labeled, um, you so, sort of, you can infect the bacteria <clears throat> and uh, then um, centrifuge the, the whole mixture and what you get in the end uh, is actually during the centrifugation, these protein code, uh, the, the protein code sort of uh, falls off the bacteria. 
and all the bacteria pellets on the on the bottom of your uh, um, of your reaction uh, vial here, um, and in the supernatant, so the uh, above the the bacteria pellet, you will have the uh, the, the bacteria uh, these bacteriophage uh, capsids, and uh, that means that because they are radioactively labeled, you de uh, detect radioactivity in the supernatant of that experiment. But if you do the experiment with the DNA uh, labeled radioactively, then you do, you do essentially the same thing. And now the uh, the pellet on the bottom of your um, um, flask contains the radioactivity. And that somehow indicates uh, or tells you that the DNA that was in the phages initially uh, ends up in the bacteria. And uh, so that also was another indication that actually the, the, the DNA is somehow, um, first of all, injected by the phages into the bacteria and it causes kind of the infection of the bacteria. Yes. Ah, yeah, that's a good uh, uh, question. Somehow. <laughs> so there, it's um, with a low kind of efficiency, bacteria can just take up DNA from the environment. So they just, that they can probably form pores in their cell wall and there, there are certain transport proteins that can actually take up DNA. Actually, that would be also a topic for the lecture that now that you said. It's uh, that there are specialized membrane pores in bacteria that can insert into the cell wall and then they spool over DNA, for example, from one bacterium to the other. That's a process called um, conjugation. But similar proteins exist that, that help you to take in DNA. But in a sense, it's also the same thing what you use in cloning. So when you 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 uh, use kind of synthetic DNA to somehow bring the sort of synthetic DNA into a bacterium, that's called transfection. And in this case, you also uh, just um, the, the bacteria somehow take up, take up the DNA. And that's usually called competence. So the bacterium must be competent. And in order to to sort of um, when you do this in the in the lab to for for genetic engineering, you either use electric fields to break open the 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 cell wall transiently, and then just something gets in by chance, or you can chemically somehow make the membrane a little more porous by with certain uh, buffers. So in a sense, the bacteria just do it. Uh, I, uh, it has to do with the fact, I guess, that in nature, but it, uh, we will come back to this later, bacteria have their own genome, but they also have these plasmids. And these are little uh, like DNA circles. And, uh, um, and apparently, the bacteria, it, under certain conditions, they just exchange pieces of DNA uh, and uh, sometimes people call that also something like a, I'm not sure what the name is, but it, it, there's like a, it's similar to the, to the, uh, a cloud for bacteria. So, so you have your own memory on your computer and there's a lot of stuff stored in the cloud. And for bacteria, it's like this, you have your own genome and there's a lot of other DNA out there. <laughs> that can be used in principle under certain conditions. And most of the time they don't need it, but you can, they download it somehow by this process. And then maybe it's okay, but uh, it's not my comparison. Somebody has it. Uh, uh, and they have this process. I think it's, it's simply because it's useful for survival that like under certain conditions, it's sometimes good to take up DNA that might help you. And and uh, maybe I should talk about this in more detail later in the lecture. Um, 
So here, um, of course, finally the famous papers by uh, Watson Crick and uh, also Rosalind Franklin. And um, they, in these uh, papers, there, there were several papers in a row in Nature. It was uh, uh, shown that DNA actually is a double helix. And we might I, uh, talk a little about this structure here in the exercise. Uh, I personally don't know a lot uh, about uh, X-ray scattering, so that it's, it's sometimes useful to remind oneself how, how that actually works, uh, And but I cannot do it in the lecture, so we can do it in the exercise. So the point is that um, what they did in these experiments is essentially uh, they made very concentrated solutions of DNA and you can pull fibers out of these concentrated solutions and then do X-ray scattering on that fiber. And uh, that gives you this uh, sub something like this uh, 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 image in X-ray scattering and the experts in, uh, uh, in X-ray scattering immediately see that such a cross-like structure means that you must have some helical structure. And the reason for that is that when you sort of scatter uh, on such a linear, like so, such an egg, uh, like a, um, polymer like molecule that is a, a helical molecule, then somehow the the scattering uh, signals they can be described by a be uh, by a Bessel function. And Bessel function you might remember from your physics lecture often plays a role when you have something with cylindrical uh, symmetry. So you have, um, and essentially this cylindrical symmetry is reflected by the these Bessel function type of uh, uh, scattering signals. And, and they actually, the max, maxima of these uh, Bessel functions, uh, or Bessel function squared, give these this cross-like structure. And from this, you could see that um, this must be a helix. And you see there are also two images. This one, which is not so nice, and that was actually by uh, uh, Morris Wilkins. And this nice image here is by uh, Rosalind Franklin. And uh, from this much nicer image, they could actually uh, estimate or, or deduce the, the uh, structure of DNA. And there is a long story about that, uh, that uh, maybe you, uh, if, uh, there are several books also about it, one by Watson himself, but also by others, that somehow um, uh, Watson and Crick somehow visited the lab of Rosalind Franklin and they saw the images lying around somehow in her office or on the desk. And from that, they got like a sneak peek into what she was working on. And then they they used that to construct a model. And it's it's kind of a controversial thing, whether this was okay or not, and, and so on. Uh, in the end, of course, because this is a more, a more nicely resolved structure than the other structure, that, that was very important for this. And uh, maybe you know from X-ray scattering all these things that uh, um, they they uh, they in a sense represent an image of your structure in reci reciprocal space. So everything needs to be sort of in inverted, which means that like these small uh, distances in this structure they correspond to large distances in the molecule, whereas the big distances correspond to the small distances in the molecule. Therefore, like the, the distance between this big scattering signal here and here, uh, from that you can calculate the distance between two base pairs, whereas the other difference here corresponds to the periodicity of the helix. And because this can be better seen here, you could actually better guess how the molecule would look like. And uh, the famous uh, thing that Watson and Crick then did is they went into the machine shop 
or they, they let somebody do it in the machine shop, actually, I don't know. And they made this uh, model for DNA and, and arranged uh, kind of these uh, molecules until they got a structure where they thought that this should result in such an X-ray structure uh, signal. So that's kind of the the famous Watson Crick model. And, uh, and now the, the tragic thing about this, of course, is that uh, the Nobel Prize was then awarded to the uh, these three uh, people and Rosalind Franklin already uh, was dead at that uh, time uh, because it was awarded in 1962 and she died from cancer in 1958. Um, uh, so that is uh, kind of a, it's a, well, famous and tragic story. Um, so the, in a sense, now it was kind of clear that DNA somehow had to do something with genes and um, also the structure of DNA is clear, but the concept of genes itself is actually not so easy and it has changed over time. And uh, in also there is kind of a redefinition of the, the concept of a gene in the last years. And I'm going to uh, talk about this in a few slides. Um, so that, of course, has a little more to do with like heredity and all these things, how people actually figure out how somehow certain traits are passed on from one generation to the next. So in a sense, the, the gene concept was developed independently from all the molecular stuff. So this is maybe the reason why you sometimes talk about molecular genetics or molecular biology is that in a sense, biology developed many of these concepts without reference to a molecule. So it was just kind of clear that, that somehow uh, organisms uh, generate offspring and certain traits are passed on us. And so you, you can develop many of these concepts without ever thinking about the molecules that actually do it. And, uh, and therefore kind of a major change came about with the uh, sort of the, the uh, discovery of the DNA structure and others that actually molecules are at the core of all kind of these biological processes. Of course, uh, probably everybody knows Mendel's experiments. I, I cannot really, I, I cannot tell you what exactly he did, but he had uh, these famous experiments in uh, with these peas uh, in, in the garden of a uh, monastery. And uh, so he sort of observed like when he somehow cross crossbred somehow peas with different appearances, like different shapes of the peas or also the flowers had different colors. And so he, he was making a lot of kind of observations and saw certain patterns in this, uh, which led to uh, his mandals that the rules of her heredity were, I don't know. I forgot how they work, but it's it's more or less like you have, let's say, these two different color colors of your um, uh, flowers, and maybe the next generation gets an intermediate intermediate color, and the next next generation, then you have maybe some that have a pure color again, and others have an intermediate or whatever. And from that, you can sort of derive a certain you can derive certain rules how this is. Uh, passed on. Um, and so this work apparently was not recognized by people, uh, by biologists until 1900. So in 1900, they somehow rediscovered his uh, kind of observations and notes. <clears throat> um, and, and then that, uh, that had a major impact like with some, some delay. Um, Charles Darwin himself had an idea what somehow genes are or how, how information is passed on to the next generation. Uh, there's a term called pangenesis. And he somehow assumed that, and I don't know exactly how to imagine this, but that uh, all parts of a, an organism 
somehow send information to the egg and tell it in a sense, so this is how it looks like this. And then this is passed on to the next generation. And then this information is used to somehow construct kind of a copy more or less of the original organism. Um, so that was not really taken up by the biology uh, community. <clears throat> uh, then uh, actually others discovered chromosomes and chromatin. And uh, this, um, the, the chromatin and chromosomes have the advantage that they are rather big structures and they can actually be uh, observed under the microscope. So this is was something that was accessible in uh, at this time. Uh, so that's an, a, a drawing from 1882 where Walter Fleming sort of draws kind of these funny structures inside the cells and, and one could also see that they somehow change and duplicate and maybe are separated during cell division. So things like this could be observed. And it is uh, interesting to see that actually at this point, of course, people didn't know that the chromatin or the chromosomes had something to do with DNA or so. But uh, but this theory here, Bovary and Sutton, apparently said that these chromosomes might be the genetic material and they can somehow explain Mendel's laws from chromosomes or chromatin. And the, the point is that, and this is something that many uh, others have later studied, that um, um, there is some process during sexual rep uh, reproduction where, uh, for example, uh, the genetic information is sort of uh, mixed between uh, uh, two kind of copies of, of the same gene, for example. And therefore, when, for example, there's such a crossing over event that maybe a piece of uh, the let's say the DNA of a uh, of the uh, of a mother organism and father organism is somehow kind of mixed. That the the probability that things are passed on together, of course, depends on how far they are separated on the molecule. So so because it's it's kind of more likely that something that is close together will be just copied together, uh, and and these patterns were sort of observed in such experiments and uh, and Thomas Morgan he he's uh, famous for his fly experiments so he did a huge number of experiments with flies and there uh, you could see for example body size and also the color of the eyes and how they would change when they somehow uh, mate with each other and generate offspring and one could also study the chromosomes uh, in these flies and he observed certain rules in, in that sense that one could see that the, the laws of heredity that Mendel already saw in the piece also played a role here and they were reflected somehow in how these chromosomes um, were distributed among the, the offspring. And from this one could actually de deduce that, yes, the chromosomes, they have something to do with heredity. So that you see that these are things that really took a very long time over many decades until people so, sort of figured out what, what is going on here. And the term gene itself actually apparently emerges in 1909, where this, uh, uh, I, I think Swedish uh, biologist Wilhelm Johansson said, uh, Gino, uh, he, he coins the term gene and he says, this is just the basic idea that a trait in the developing organism can be determined or is influenced by something in the gametes. Uh, and um, no hypothesis about the nature of this something should be postulated or supported by it. So he just wanted to have a name for this kind of vague feeling that there is something that, that is responsible for. For this. Um, 
So you see that this here, it was completely unclear what it is. Uh, here, of course, they, they said, well, it must be somehow in, in the in chromatin. Um, and later, sort of it became more and more clear that it must be a molecule. And here's one paper uh, that is famous. It's called the three man paper, drei Männer Arbeit. Uh, between these three people here, uh, Delbrück, Timofeyev, Rezovsky, and uh, Zimmer. And they were actually looking at the influence of radiation on uh, genetic, uh, on, 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 on um, mutations uh, in organisms. And the, the reason why this is important is that uh, it was sort of <clears throat> known what radio... Uh, uh, what what uh, radiation was, and uh, and the, the fact that radiation causes mutations in organisms means that the radiation, which it would be gamma rays and alpha uh, uh, rays and and beta and so on, they must somehow they must do something in the in the organisms, and from that you can sort of estimate. Uh, um, from something like, let's say, the cross section of interaction between your radiation and and your molecules, they from that they estimated that the genes must be complexes of about one thousand atoms. That's kind of a crazy statement, which they so sort of de derive from from this fact that radiation must interact somehow with with um uh, with molecules or with atoms. Um, so that was a hint that, that this, this, these must be molecules somehow. And um, Schrödinger wrote this famous book, What is Life? And uh, he, uh, from a very different perspective, said, uh, of course, that if you want to pass on information uh, in some type of process, it would be good to have an aperiodic crystal. And the reason is that it's uh, somehow easy to replicate a crystal because you would have a regular arrangement of things and you just copy this regular arrangement. But if it's something periodic, it doesn't contain information because, uh, well, the, it, the information is, is zero for something periodic. Um, and so therefore it must be aperiodic. And to find and in a sense, of course, that anticipated the structure of DNA, that DNA has a very regular structure, but at the same time, at each position, for, uh, at e each base pair could be a different base pair. So it is actually a, a realization of this aperiodic crystal, which Schrödinger proposed maybe more from, from, a, uh, from logical considerations and at this time here. And in the end, of course, sort of they found that DNA is this aperiodic crystal and also made reference to this. And uh, there is this famous last uh, sentence in the Watson Crick paper um, where they write, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Uh, and this is, um, of course, related to this um, uh, idea that one strand can template another strand uh, for copying. So I'm OK, I'm way behind my schedule. <laughs> I think I should speed up a little. Um, so here. Uh, is another overview of this, uh, but it contains essentially what I just told you, that there is kind of this long history, Mendel, uh, then Johansson uh, terms the, uh, the, the uh, term Gene, Morgan with his flies, Watson Crick, uh, until like uh, our present day more or less, um, so genetic code was actually elucidated later on in 1965. Uh, and um, 
the whole genome, in a sense, the first draft of the human genome was published in 2001 and completed a little later. Uh, so there were still gaps and uh, at, at this time. And then there was the so-called ENCODE project that uh, was actually looking at what uh, products, what the gene products actually the DNA codes for. So in, through all these investigations, uh, the, there have been changes in the sort of understanding or the, the meaning of what gene actually uh, means. And here is uh, a definition from 2006, and uh, it's it's a little strange, uh, but uh, I hope it will uh, become clear on the next slide. So they said a gene is a locatable region of genomic sequence corresponding to a unit of inheritance, which is associated with regulatory regions, transcribed regions, and or other functional sequence regions. And the reason why that was adapted, or, um, or uh, uh, this, this definition was, was adopted, is the uh, fact that in particular, this genome, this ENCODE project, where they studied essentially all the, the kind of products that are generated from a genome by transcription in a cell, they found that only one to two percent actually generate proteins and all the other other parts of the genome are actually transcribed, but they are mainly just generating RNA molecules, some non-coding RNA, uh, mainly regulatory RNAs. And, and then of course, when you take the, the rather, let's say traditional point of view where you say, well, a gene codes for a protein, this is simply not true. So it's not a, a gene just produces one protein, uh, but in most of the cases, as you see, it, it produces actually uh, uh, just an RNA that has a different role than DNA, uh, than a protein. But there's also other effects that maybe one genomic region can generate different types of protein. Uh, there are these processes called alternative splicing, for example, where the same genomic region produces different types of uh, protein. And, and so on. So therefore, it was kind of difficult to find a, a definition that really fits all of these uh, uh, kind of observations. And here is one picture that somehow tries to explain that. So on, on DNA in the end, and we will learn much more about it in the lecture, of course, DNA is this double helical molecule that has two strands that are, that are shown here. And let's say on your DNA, you have these regions, A, B, C, D, and E. And now an RNA polymerase will make RNA uh, copies from this DNA. And these RNA copies might look like this here. And so they would either go from the beginning until here, or they will only transcribe a part of it. And now in eukaryotic systems, uh, like like in uh, in us, these RNA molecules are further processed. They are spliced. And the splicing leads to, for example, uh, cutting away pieces of the, the RNA. So you will end up with a collection of RNA molecules after splicing that might look like this. And these then actually might be translated into proteins, and then you get a collection of different proteins, maybe a, collect, uh, a protein composed of two domains, A and B, another protein composed of A and C, another from B and C, and so on. But other, uh, other RNA molecules might not be translated into a protein at all. They would be a regulatory non-coding RNA, and that's shown here. And based on this, you need to somehow consider what what would you call a gene, and they, uh, this kind of definition somehow says that now you would call kind of some of um, these kind of components that sort of belong together, and that our final products from this DNA region they would belong to they would be a gene. Mm -hmm. 
And so they, they uh, this definition would say that this contains four genes. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to argue with you about it, but this is how they, they defined it. And uh, it should just indicate that things are kind of complicated. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence between a, a, a section of DNA and a gene or a protein and a gene, but it's complicated because of all these processes that, that take place. So that was kind of a very long introduction. And uh, now I'm going to speed up a little and just briefly talk about how DNA actually looks like as a molecule. And this, um, these are things that you probably all already know from, from other lectures. Um, or maybe I should ask, what is your background? <laughs> I'm sorry. Physics, uh, biomedical engineering, or chemistry, or who is physics? Ah, okay. Everybody knows everything about DNA? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, these, um, we have these five bases, uh, and adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, they belong to DNA molecules, whereas uracil uh, takes the role of thymine in RNA. So these are called bases, and the chemists distinguish between so-called purines and pyrimidines. Um, you do not have to remember the, the structures here, but the purines derive from this type of uh, parent molecule, purine, which uh, are, it, it, it's this kind of double uh, cycle here. So the chemists call something like this a heterocycle because you have different, you, you do not only have uh, carbons in this uh, molecule, but carbons and nitrogens. So the pyrimidines are this one uh, cycle here and there are two in the purine. Um, so these would be only nucleobases and they are attached to a sugar at this, uh, and this is the sugar deoxyribose in uh, DNA at one position, and that's indicated here. So this N here, and for the pyrimidines, this N is attached to the sugar. And the nomenclature goes like this, that you call the carbon to which the base is attached, that's the one prime carbon. It's a, it gets, it's called one prime because the chemists number the atoms in the, the base and they are numbered without prime. So it's one, two, three, four, and so on uh, for the atoms in this uh, base and the atoms in the sugar get numbered with prime numbers. So one prime, two prime, and so on. Uh, you can calculate, uh, sorry, you can, can uh, check what numbers they have. That's one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. Uh, these are the carbon atoms in this deoxyribose. And the point about deoxy is that the two prime carbon doesn't contain any oxygen. Whereas in RNA, this carbon is connected to an OH group and uh, uh, so ribose really has a two prime OH and deoxyribose doesn't have one. And then there's also the phosphate that's attached to the five prime carbon. <clears throat> and a nucleotide is the combination of uh, the phosphate, the sugar, and the base. And also um, the um, the nomenclature also tells you that when you don't have a phosphate, you should call it a nucleoside. So a nucleoside is only the sugar and the base. So these are nucleosides. Nucleotides are the bases when they contain the phosphate and nucleobases are only the bases. And uh, if you do it correctly, you should also use different names and this is sometimes handled rather sloppily, but uh, if you want to write a chemistry paper, you should call 
these things. For example, adenylate, when you're really talking about an adenine nucleotide and adenosine when it's only the sugar. And therefore, for example, ATP is called adenosine triphosphate because it's the adenosine and you have three phosphates to earn and so on. So of course, it somehow makes sense in the end. Um, there are actually many symbols. You also don't have to remember them, but maybe sometimes you see something like this when you read a paper and uh, there is a nomenclature for um, that that um, tries to somehow convey that sometimes, for example, it's not important which base it is, but it's only important that it's a pyrimidine or a purine. And sometimes it's not important which nucleotide it is at all and other things. And this is, uh, then there are different symbols for this that you sometimes find in the DNA sequence. So not all always sequences look like A, T, C, G, and so on. But sometimes they contain, for example, W, S, um, and uh, B, D, H, V, N, R, and Y. So the more common, at least for me, I would say is the R and the Y. So the R only tells you it's a purine and the Y tells you it's it's a pyrimidine. So it can be C or T in this case, or it can be A or G. That sort of is important often. And you often see just an N, for example, and N just means it doesn't matter. It's one of four bases. So the only things that you might want to remember is uh, R, Y, and N, and the rest uh, nobody remembers. So so we can we can strong refers to the fact that A T uh, base pairs are weaker than uh, G C base pairs, but I I think that I don't really see this quite often. So so I would really yeah I'm just mentioning it here. Now, the other thing is that uh, we already found that there is this five prime carbon and the, uh, this carbon here would be the three prime carbon. And in the context of DNA, they are, they are linked together in this way. So you have the, the phosphate at the five prime and the three prime in the nucleotide, that would be an OH group, but the OH, group actually is uh, um, connected to the this phosphate on the five prime of the next um, uh, the, the next nucleotide. <clears throat> now again for for those who are interested in chemistry, so in, in chemistry when you uh, when uh, an alcohol like an OH group reacts with a, with an acid, you call that an ester. And uh, but usually an ester would be like an alcohol uh, reacts with a uh, with a carbon uh, acid like COH. Uh, but here we have a, a reaction with an alcoholic group like this uh, OH group with um, phosphorus acid in a sense with the phosphate, and therefore this is called a phosphoester. But this ester actually it, there's an ester of this phosphorus group with the OH group here and the other OH group here, and therefore it's called a phosphodiester. So this kind of phosphoric acid is easterized with two OH groups with two alcohols, and therefore it's called a phosphodiester. So that's the phosphodiester bond between neighboring nucleotides. And uh, the, under the typical pH uh, values that you work in 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 normal under, under normal conditions or in a cell, this uh, phosphate is always hydrolyzed, which means that it's always negatively charged. And then this is where your high negative charge comes from in DNA. And therefore, uh, you can also look at the DNA as uh, you can call it a polyacid. A polyacid is just like a polymer with acid monomers. And because the acid is dissociated, 
it is negatively charged and therefore it's also a poly electrolyte. It, it just has um, many charged groups and it's a polymer. The other important point is that, um, of course, this gives you a direction. So um, when you have a certain base here, uh, at, at uh, well, certain bases at the different positions, then it makes a difference whether you count them from the five prime to the three prime end or vice versa. It's just a different molecule. So let's say we have A, A, T, T here, then it, it's just, just a different molecule when you now reverse the direction. It's not the same the same thing. So therefore the direction plays a role and that also plays a role <clears throat> in the context of the helix because it turns out that the, the Watson-Crick helix really is formed by two anti-parallel strands. And usually this is uh, indicated by an arrow uh, and the arrow points towards the three prime end. So it's always drawn from five prime to three prime. And uh, in, for, in a helix, you always have kind of opposite directions of these two uh, strands. And this is another representation of it. So here, the uh, helicity is also indicated. And um, um, here you can uh, also see a few of the uh, kind of the, the distances. So there is uh, 0 0.34 nanometers for, between these phosphates here. And the diameter of the DNA is about 2 nanometers. <clears throat> Um, so this is also taken from a, uh, from this molecular biology book. So that's the there is hydrogen bonding between the bases, um, and that is Im important for the kind of molecular recognition between the bases. It turns out that the stability of the helix is not determined by the hydrogen bonds, or not not determined alone by them, but uh, the major contribution to the stability of the helix is actually an interaction between the base pairs that sit next to each other. That's a so-called stacking interaction, which is, is a, a mixture of different types of interactions. Um, and uh, we are going coming back to this uh, a little more in the next uh, lecture. And also when we talk about thermodynamics, so the, the point is that, for example, these uh, um, these heterocycles, they contain uh, these pi electron systems. Maybe you remember that from chemistry. So these, these rings, they have these delocalized pi electrons that are kind of above and below the ring. And they sort of represent a negatively charged cloud that can be polarized, for example by other charges. And, and this can also lead to kind of induced interaction, induced uh, dipole interactions between neighboring bases. And there are certain other kind of contributions. So all of these things somehow play together uh, to stabilize the helix. So it's not only the hydrogen bonds. The reason why these things can actually form hydrogen bonds is that uh, all these bases, maybe I, I'm going, coming back to a different representation like this here. Of course, these, um, uh, so hydrogen bonds typically occur when you have a very electronegative atom that is bound to a hydrogen that, uh, and this, uh, um, uh, in a sense, one of these hydrogen atoms is shared by two of these electronegative atoms. So this is shown here, for example, this uh, N, uh, this hydrogen here belongs to the thymine here, but it somehow also connects a little to the uh, nitrogen on that cycle here. And uh, the same is true here and so on. So that's that's kind of, uh, you can also describe it in roughly in a similar way, like a covalent bond where an electron is exchanged by two kind of partners, if you want. Um, so that, that, gives you some type of stabilization. But you also see that uh, this is not the uh, unique choice. So you can 
also make other hydrogen bonds because you have, for example, a nitrogen here. Here's a nitrogen that is not used. This CO could also form a, a hydrogen bond. And uh, what is important is that these specific Watson Crick hydrogen bonds only occur in the context of that helix, uh, whereas uh, free in solution in principle, these spaces can do all kinds of other interactions, and that's shown here. So that's Watson Crick, but there are also others that sometimes play a role, in particular in RNA structure or in, in certain unconventional RNA structures. Uh, the most famous ones are the Hoogstein base pairing, for example. Uh, and uh, then there's also GG binding, um, which I cannot see right now. Uh, here is GG. And uh, there's also additional possibilities when under certain pH conditions, some of the, the, the nucleotides are actually also protonated. <clears throat> and one of the most uh, famous kind of structures that might have biological importance is the G quadruplex. And it turns out that four Gs can actually make such a structure with each other by making kind of quite a number of hydrogen bonds and, and then forming kind of the structure. And this is a very stable structure. And it, it's uh, actually under certain conditions, it's more stable than a DNA duplex. Usually it uh, requires an additional ion in the middle that somehow stabilizes it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there has been a long and ongoing discussion whether this actually plays, plays a, has a biological uh, role because people in bioinformatics found that certain there's a certain accumulation of G tracts in certain genomic regions. And uh, there was always the sort of... Uh, hypothesis that maybe sometimes DNA melts open at one point and forms quadruplexes instead, and then they would actually act as obstacles or deactivate genes. And But this is something that's, I, I think it's still not completely clear. Also, these uh, Gs naturally occur in the so-called telomeres um, in DNA. And we will come back to this probably later during DNA replication. So the, the big problem with the replication of a double-stranded molecule is, uh, is that you can easily replicate one of the molecules in one direction, but it's not so easy to replicate the other molecule because the polymerase always goes from five prime to three prime end. So you can easily replicate in, in one direction. The other uh, has the problem that it, um, you would actually not be able to replicate the very end of a linear DNA molecule because you cannot start the sort of the, the polymerization at the end somehow. And this is solved in nature by the so-called telomeres that or the, the telomerase, which just adds a repetitive sequence to the end of the chromosome so they are not degrading over time. And the tel telomerase actually contains a little piece of RNA that is used as a template for making this extension of the ends of the chromosomes, the so-called telomeres. And they actually naturally contain a lot of these Gs because of uh, this kind of process. So there is, uh, there is a lot of, uh, there are many ideas and uh, on the role of these Gs and people have, uh, for example, developed also uh, chemicals that stabilize G quadruplexes and other things in the context of, of cancer therapies. <clears throat> uh, it turns out that in cancer, there is an enhanced activity of telom tel telomerase. And uh, the idea is if you can inhibit these, then you would somehow uh, reduce maybe the, the uh, cancer growth or something like that. So therefore, this is kind of important also. Another unconventional binding mode is the, are these DNA triplexes. So sometimes 
a third strand can actually bind to a double strand. And now you'll see that because the bases in the double helix, they already form Watson-Crick base pairs, the third strand cannot Watson-Crick base pair anymore. So it must form different types of hydrogen bonds with the du uh, double strand. And uh, these are typically Hoogstein base pairs. These are these others, like in this big list, they are somehow so, uh, somehow like base pairs like this. And essentially what, what happens is that the third strand takes the, the available hydrogen bonding sites in this major groove of the DNA to, to sort of uh, bind. Actually, I, I forgot to say that DNA has a major and a minor groove that will also become important later. So if you look at this uh, model of DNA, you see that uh, the distance from this uh, backbone phosphate to, the, oops, to this one is much shorter than this here. And uh, therefore, this is called minor groove and this is called major groove. And this minor groove actually runs along the whole helix. So you can follow this minor groove So the, uh, and the major groove. Uh, sort of go all along kind of the, the whole DNA double helix. And this is important because um, many proteins sort of are specialized to bind to the major groove, for example, or to the minor groove, because there's more space in the major groove, so there's more major groove binders, and also this, this specific triplex binding takes place in the major groove. So that's, that's that. Um, so you... you this is just a crash course to tell you everything about the DNA structure that has nothing to do with physics in, in the first lecture. So I um, there are kind of different types of secondary structures or conformations of DNA. So the B DNA is the one that you usually find in a, in a cellular context under physiological conditions. <clears throat> Uh, and what you should also see is that the bases are not perfectly perpendicular to the axis of the helix. So they are slightly tilted, but not a lot. Uh, there are There's another version that's called ADNA. And here you see that the bases are much more tilted. Also, the difference between major and minor groove is less. The ADNA is also kind of wider. And the helical rise from here to here is shorter than for BDNA. And this type of DNA occurs, for example, when you have an RNA duplex. So RNA forms ADNA duplexes. Also RNA DNA forms uh, these uh, duplexes. And also <clears throat> BDNA transforms to ADNA under I think when it's dehydrated <clears throat> and under certain solvent conditions. The important point is that both are right-handed helices. So they are uh, the kind of DNA strands go like a right hand around the helix axis. Uh, and uh, whereas there's one version that is actually left-handed, that's the cDNA that uh, only occurs for certain sequences under certain buffer conditions. But normally, uh, BDNA and ADNA, these are right-handed helices. And uh, uh, you, um, well, if you work a lot with DNA or RNA and become obsessed with it, you will realize that most people depict DNA with the wrong helicity. <laughs> so, like, in, in particular, graphics designers uh, and uh, like you, you see left-handed DNA helices everywhere. And to me, um, I have the impression that there are more left-handed helices in the kind of outside of science than, <laughs> than right-handed helices. I think that graphics designers like left-handed helices more from a aesthetic point of view. And they propagate, of course, because of uh, copy and paste mechanisms in the internet. So it's kind of, but so remember it's a double helix. <laughs> um, you can actually make left-handed DNA uh, chemically and that's actually not 
uninteresting because enzymes cannot recognize left-handed DNA. And that's one possibility to uh, increase stability and other things. But um, so there have been people working a little with left-handed uh, DNA for, for certain things. So RNA um, is composed kind of essentially of the same building blocks as DNA, except that you now have the two prime OH group here and uracil takes the place of thymine. I already mentioned that. And because it typically occurs as a single strand, it doesn't make it doesn't make a, a pure double helix, but it occurs in all kinds of structures. And some RNA structures are extremely complicated. And uh, uh, here are different depictions of like one molecule that, <clears throat> of course, it can, for example, base pair with itself somehow, somewhere. So it will make one of these A form helices in this region, in this region. And then there are also additional interactions like, uh, uh, that, that would be called tertiary interactions, where, for example, this loop here base pairs with this loop and this with, with this one, so that the 3D structure looks like, like this here. So we are going to talk a little about RNA structure in the lecture, it turns out that RNA structures like this here are actually that it's similarly difficult uh, to, to predict like protein structures. It's, it's difficult in a different way than proteins and people uh, are making progress over the last years, but it's uh, still in particular for very large RNA structures, not so easy and not so clear how to uh, predict that. Of course, now every everything changes with um, machine learning and, and other approaches. But it turns out that, for example, AlphaFold that is used by people to predict protein structure has a huge database, or that they use the huge database to train their neural network uh, of, of um, protein structures. But you do not have that huge database for RNA structures. And therefore, this is actually not as advanced at this point. Um, so now I'm going to, I'm at the end of this lecture. Uh, I, I will finish the rest hopefully next time. So it's, it's only about like a little nomenclature. Maybe we can also skip that. Uh, and um, <clears throat> as I, I said, I'm, I'm not here next week. So I'm trying to figure out how we are going to continue with this lecture. I will try to set up the survey for our kind of preferred dates. And uh, I'm not sure when I, when we are going to start with the tutorials because I, uh, so maybe, yeah, I will just send you some information via, via Moodle uh, because um, I'm not here next week. So if we had um, a tutorial already in two weeks on one of these days, I would still need to upload some something that we can talk about in the tutorial. So one obvious thing would be, for example, talking about uh, this X-ray structure, how this kind of this uh, this cross-like structure emerges from from the. But uh, um, for this, I would upload kind of something like a exercise sheet or so. But I will just send around an email. There's there's a question in the chat, which I cannot read in my classes. <laughs> okay, what does it say? Um, a friend of mine who is attending the other lecture that is being held in parallel just informed me that they have set the following lecture dates to 4 p.m. Okay. So you can go to the other lecture right now. <laughs> no, not right now, next time. Okay, so we will keep this date for the lecture anyway, but we still need to find a tutorial date and I will make the uh, survey of that. Okay, thank you very much. See you in two weeks somehow. <laughs>